it was as much the absence of good as the presence of bad that made my life difficult because I didn't, I didn't really know what normal was. I was different, you know? I processed emotions differently than my sisters. I feel, you know, different in a way. Uh, I feel like it's, I have something going on where I have three lovely voices inside my head. Yeah, prior to high school, I, I don't remember this, feeling this way. I think the only time that I didn't feel like I was depressed was maybe six years old. I got a B in on one of my report cards. I had a panic attack at six. So um, I grew up with my mom, my sister, and my maternal grandparents. My dad, biological father, lived with us for a little bit, but he left when I was around six years old. Um, and so prior to that, there was domestic violence uh, through him. My mother was 16 when she got pregnant with my sister, so she was super young and she was a victim of domestic violence. My biological father was abusive to her, but also to me and my sister. And then when my mother was 19, um, she remarried. My stepfather was um, just, just uh, I'm a child molester, I guess is what to say. So he was just inappropriate and abusive. Another aspect that probably exacerbated this as well was um, my sexuality and my that identity and wrestling with that for so 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 long I would uh, constantly hear the word faggot flung from some of my best friends and I quickly decided I <laughs> I don't want to be that people don't like that but that yeah feeling again Maybe that's where the sense of inadequacy and feeling less than uh, stemmed from. I grew up, you know, in football. Football was my number one deal. I, I played as the as an offensive lineman. You know, the, the guys that are in football, you're the you're one out of the five guys that are in the front lines about to hit the guy that's in front of you and cross the line of scrimmage. So if you want it to be, you know, you, you got to be tough, you know, you got to be, you got to be strong. So you have these coaches embedded into your head saying that, you know, you know, pain is weakness leaving the body. Suck it up, buttercup, you know, put some dirt on that wound. And so when it comes to being, you know, a man that has this mental, you know, condition, it's, you know, I guess during those six years of me not seeking help from 06 to 12, is I didn't want to show weakness as well. Inside my head, I feel like there's always been that innocent child that doesn't know what right from wrong is and isn't trying to harm. And that's like the good Ava, the little Ava. And then there's always felt like that really self-injurious part of myself that I've always kind of referred to as bad Ava. And I, I think that had a lot to do with the things I was told as a kid. You're dumb, you're dumb, you're stupid, you're stupid, you talk too much, you talk too much, you're a disgrace to the family. And it was just like all of those things like piling up on like a five, six, seven year old. It destroyed the way that I see myself. I didn't understand that the situation and the circumstances were what was wrong. I felt like something about myself was wrong. I attracted or brought out in my stepfather. I didn't know that you should feel safe in your body or you should feel good in your body. Like my body was like, I felt like a threatening place. I was using drugs. I feel like that exacerbated the major depressive disorder. Um, but I started going to a psychologist with my father, and that's when they discovered they're like, major depressive disorder is what we're dealing with here. So the anxiety's always been there. The way that it presented itself was almost like an asthma attack. I was the first diagnosed case in Texas of having nervous cough. Anytime something um, that really attacked my nerves got a hold of me, I would cough myself into this frenzy where I could not breathe. 
most of the time whenever I would say I would have my um, episodes is that my body would feel hollow. Um, I could see everything, but I could not control anything. And so whenever the voices would take over and in those instances, you know, I would tend to break that by doing self-harm. So I had cuts and gashes all over me. Um, I was very unkept. Hygiene, like I said, was atrocious. Well, I was 11 when I uh, actively made an attempt to end my life. I don't have any recollection of how many times I tried from the age of 11 to 18. So I had attempted earlier that day. My sister went and told my mom and then that's when they uh, took me to the hospital. That's when I started seeing a therapist and I started taking medication. That was a whole process uh, for my family, mainly my mom. She immediately thought that my therapist was a bad influence on me or was telling me lies or pitting her, pitting me against my mother. So I quickly learned that I would just tell my mom very, very little, but still keep her included. I mean, there were many suicide attempts before I was hospitalized or diagnosed with anything other than ADHD. There was self, there was self harm. There was, there was drug use. There was alcohol use. Um, there was eating disorders. It was sophomore year of high school, the first week of sophomore year. I had attempted suicide. And this time I told a friend. They called the, an ambulance and made me throw up. And that was the first time I was hospitalized in an inpatient hospital. And that was the first time my family noticed anything. And they diagnosed me with like, like symptoms of schizophrenia, symptoms of borderline personality disorder, bipolar, just all of it, you know, OCD, this, that, 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 that. And I was like, give me more, give me more, give me more. I was diagnosed with everything and I wanted to be. I was like, diagnose me with anything and everything. Define me so I don't have to define myself. You know, I started hearing those voices go to, to San Angelo, go to Dallas. It was 12 o'clock at midnight, and I remember driving to San Angelo. That's a three-hour drive from, from here in Austin. And then I went to, from around 3, 3 10, 3, 30, I drove from San Angelo to Dallas, and that's another, you know, three hours. I passed that out the wheel, and I awoke to having my head slammed into the steering wheel. And when I realized what I've done, I rear-ended a lady, you know, in the back of my head. I was like, I know I need to get help. I know this is the time. And then now, a little bit later down the road is when I was like, okay. Whenever that option of the hospital was coming through, I was like, yeah, it's time. Like, I need, I need to go. Let's go to this hospital. And that's what changed the whole game of us, you know. I actually went with a bunch of friends to see the movie Born on the Fourth of July, which was with Tom Cruise, and it was about the Vietnam War, actually. Up until my early 20s, I thought that was the only thing that caused post-traumatic stress was war. So I saw that movie and was with a bunch of my friends, and we went back to the dorm, and we were all doing a stress test. So I'd never done a stress test before, and it was like, how many times in your life have you moved? How many people died? How many... You know, it was all these questions. So that night I went to bed and I was like, I've had so much stress in my life and I'm doing great. I woke up the next morning with a raging anxiety attack. I mean, I, it was horrible. I thought I was dying. I had never had an anxiety attack. So all of a sudden now I have this anxiety I can't get rid of. It feels totally consuming. Um, it's so uncomfortable. I felt so uneasy in my skin. Um, and that led me to therapy when depression really manifests and I was diagnosed was that was around COVID. It started in my feet and it was a sensation of tingling. And the tingling sensation drove itself all the way up to my chest and it stopped there. And then I really panicked <laughs> because it stopped there. Um, and so I sat down and my body was exhausted. I could not work. I could not get out of bed. I could not help my wife with our very young child. My mind was telling my body, 
you've got to go get this done during the day. You've got to take care of your family. You've got to take care of your son. You've got to get out of your bed. You've got to brush your teeth. And my body could not move. My depression isn't me being sad constantly or in a state of self-pity all the time. It, it seems to be a state of constant overwhelm. Like there is just too much to tackle at all times. It feels like I'm wearing 10 weighted vests. Like when you go to the, den the dentist and they have to take an x-ray and they put a weighted vest on you, a lead vest. Feels like I'm wearing like 10 of them and I'm just, oh, I just feel so heavy trying to perform. Uh, any simple task seems daunting. So, I mean, with the MS, that has only been exacerbated. When I was first diagnosed with MS, I'd say my mental health took a nosedive. Um, I felt like my back was up against a wall. Like, my doctors made it seem to me like I had no options. Like, I'm going to be blind and in a wheelchair by the time I'm 30, so there you go. I'm still in disbelief about all of this. Like, this still does not seem real. It's been 12 years, though. I had never been in the hospital except to get my wisdom teeth out. I had never had an overnight in the hospital until, um, until I had what we thought was a torsed cyst. Well, eventually I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I have just finished doing treatment and have moved into um, looking at different hospice services in my area because there's not any other treatments right now that are working for my cancer. The same month that I had my surgery, um, a study came out on people with post-traumatic stress disorder um, are twice as likely to be diagnosed with ovarian cancer. At first I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety, but it's really post-traumatic stress. It, it enraged me because I was like, if these are normal responses to abnormal situations, why do I have the label? Like I'll change and I'll heal, but how do family systems change if the people that cause trauma don't change and if the people that are wounded by trauma are getting the label? It's why I became an activist because I was like, it's not enough for individuals to heal. Systems have to change. I think when it comes to mental health ad activists or advocates, I'm not entirely sure how people view them, but I, I worry sometimes that they might think that we have it all together when I don't have it together. And I do have my moments of just, I don't think I'm making any difference or am I doing enough within my advocacy? But there are just some days where if I get up and I, just get through the day, that's that's surviving, that's, that's a win for me. Thank goodness for the resources that I'm blessed to have access to, because I, I know there are others that don't, um, that can help me navigate this disease. Um, because I, all of these years I felt feeling less than, now I feel any area of my life, I feel like I can take it on full throttle. And I remember thinking to myself, I'll never forget it. This must be what normal feels like. I'm an introvert, I'm shy. I would have never seen myself standing in front of a lot of people if it wasn't for those, like, um, those things that I was going through. The first time, this is when I first started sharing my story, I had a parent come up to me and she said, you know, you are, you're a hero. I, um, I instantly said, uh, I'm not a hero. I, I, I told her, you know, I'm, I'm not a hero. I'm just a, um, I'm just a man. And she said, no, you, save so many people today like 
you you put yourself down on the line and open up and said you're you're my hero and to hear that it it like removed some of the callus that was in my heart of like self-doubt and my insecurities um it helps move and so i guess that's what made me like see that you know i could be a hero for someone even if it's just one person i i could be that 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 help <laughs> and so when i was diagnosed with all those things it was that's how i defined myself with this broken person so the idea of becoming someone that doesn't hate themselves or that hurts or that doesn't hurt and feet and like constantly go through pain. It was so scary. Yeah, it is. It's so relieving to just admit that it's difficult. So I wrote this song. Um, it's called find your legs and I wrote it about like trying to live life outside of the inpatient hospital about like trying to like metaphorically find, find your legs, like figure out like how to fucking walk without somebody like holding your hips up or like holding on to both sides of your arms, you know, like how to figure out how to fucking be in life of without, I don't know, you know, let's see. Running all alone till you feel free. It ain't fun but studded roads with a false debris. Guarantee your third degree be just enough. Cause family is falsity in your life's gloves. Find your legs. And it dissects the bona fide Cause you play fetch with neglect till all collides Self-prescribe for maldehyde to face the edge But when you're tired, I'd heart it, child mind disconnect Oh, it's a stretch to try again But you know better 